Hey, everybody. Donnie Gardner here with the Boston Terror Society. In today's podcast episode, I actually have a very special guest. She's going to be talking about how she turned her Boston Terriers into models. Her name is Patty Alleman, and she has been handling Boston Terriers for the last 20 years. She started as a junior handler all the way back at age 11 or 12. She's going to tell us her complete story, how she got started in the industry. She's appeared on the John Oliver Show. She's actually been Saturday Night Live, met a lot of big celebrities there. But her skit got cut right at the last minute. But she's going to tell us all about that in today's episode. If you want to learn more about how they can become a model, just visit this article. So go to bostonterriersociety.com forward slash Boston Terrier Model Interview, and you'll be able to see in the show notes all the links to help get you pointed in the right direction. Without further ado, let's get started in today's episode. Patty, if you could just go ahead and start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your Boston. Absolutely. I currently share my house with one Boston and a couple other breeds, but I do co-own quite a few dogs, so it's a tricky question to kind of answer because they're sort of spread out. I have been in Boston for, I think we're coming up on 22 years now. I started with the junior handler, about 11 or 12 years old. I began showing my dogs. And then shortly after that began breeding and have had numerous Bostons throughout the years. Right now we share our home with a super cute guy named Bowie. He is my daughter's absolute best friend in the whole wide world. That's kind of what we have right now. Do you get started with dogs just in general with Bostons or was it a different breed that kind of led you to Boston? My parents had a hobby farm and my mom was a dog trainer for a service mm-hmm. dog program. And also groomers. So dogs have sort of played a central role in my life. But I hit a doll at 11 or 12, and I told my mom I wanted, like, my dog. I wanted a dog that was my very, very own. And I got in my head that I needed a pug. I needed a pug in my life. So she said, well, okay, we can get you a dog. What do you want? And I said, a pug. And she's like, oh, okay, that's an interesting choice. We had labs. Uh-huh. It was a, a very less turn for me. And... We ended up going to Delaware County Pug Rescue, and I got an absolutely awesome pug named Biggs, who was big. He was about Uh a 30-pound pug. And coming from a background where we do a lot of training, I wanted to do something with Biggs. We tried obedience, and he was not the brightest. And we tried agility, and it turned out that his knees weren't so great. So on kind of a crazy whim, I tried confirmation handling and I went to my first class looked at my mom and I was like this is it this is my thing the rest of my life this is it which was kind of crazy to decide at 11 or 12 and the instructor from the class who I still know today looked at my mom and he's like she's really good at this she's got a natural knack but she needs a confirmation dog a friend of ours knew someone who bred pugs because I was still on my pug kick and we went to Miriam Hinckley's house her kennel name was Coke, K-O-C-H. And I was supposed to go and look at pugs. And she had, I want to say, a three or four week old litter of Boston's there. And my pug loyalty went out the window. Uh-huh. I was like, you know what? That's adorable. I need one. And we put a deposit on a Boston. And that was Diva, my very first Boston. And she came home with us a couple weeks later. And I really haven't looked back. That was it. She was my gateway Boston. Yeah. Did you start doing confirmations in with her? Yeah. I did junior handling with her where they actually judge the child's ability to handle over the dog. Mm -hmm. And I did a little confirmation with her. She was a beautiful little dog. So cute. About 13 pounds, brindle and white, well-marked, beautiful, beautiful eyes. They just melted your heart every time you looked at her. But she had some structural faults. She just kind of became my BFF. And we did juniors together, and she did some sweet steak stuff when she was a senior, just for fun, because she really loved going in the ring more than anything else. But that was her thing. And then when I realized that she wasn't really a good candidate for a breed dog, she actually didn't pass some of her health testing for her eyes. Mm -hmm. We went and actually looked for some really nice dogs from some health-tested lines that were 
structurally sound and ready to take that step to the next level and start breeding. That was maybe, I want to say, two years after I got Diva, we did that. Okay. How long have you been breeding Boston Terriers? About 20 years. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, in Boston's 22, I've been breeding Boston's about 20 years. Very extensive as far as knowledge and everything else. Yeah, I started early. A lot yeah, of people look at me and go, wait, you've been in the breed how long? And it's like, okay, but... I kind of had a leg up on it with the junior handling. So. <laughs> right. You had a decade of experience before people turned 22. Yes. Yeah. As far as, like, me coming across you and everything, you know, just finding you on Facebook, and I saw, I'm not sure if it was Bowie, that was basically as a model. How did you get started doing modeling for your Boston Terriers? And, like, when did that start? A couple of years ago, a friend of mine whose husband, who's also a friend, is a photographer reached out to me. I know them through confirmation showing. And they said, hey, you have really nice Boston's. Her husband had gotten the chance to photograph my dogs for a breed magazine cover. It's a show magazine. And she said, you have really beautiful dogs that photograph really well. And they generally behave pretty nicely. I was like, thank you very much. And she said, we used to do this thing now and then in New York. We have an agent for our dogs, but our dogs are old. And the one who did the most stuff for the agent passed and she reached out to me and she's looking for some really nice dogs that are breed appropriate structure and well behaved and not going to pee on the sets or act wild <laughs> uh-huh. who would like to come up for this photo shoot can I give her your name and your email and I said absolutely that sounds like fun and she went ahead and gave my name and number to the agent and the agent reached out to me and said well here's the requirements for this shoot can you send me pictures of your dogs? What do you have? And let's see if the client bites, you know. Let's yeah. see if they like how your dogs look. They're not the only ones in the running. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, we'll try. At the time, I had four girls at that point and a boy. And the client specifically asked for females. I went ahead and I sent photos of the girls, which would have been... Patty, Tara, Eloise, and Havana. And they ended up picking Eloise, who, cute as a button, she was tiny. Because they were working with children, they wanted a smaller dog. Mm -hmm. And Ellie weighed maybe 12 pounds. Black and white, again. Oh, she was teeny. Mm -hmm. Giant, enormous, expressive eyes, and smart. She's the one who made it so that I used to have to keep clips on all of our crates because she could turn everyone loose to play with them. Oh, yes. And that was her whole goal. It wasn't, you know, turning them loose for anything. She just wanted to play. She Mm -hmm. just wanted to hang out with her friends. They picked her, and she was kind of always my go-to for most shoots because, one, she was little, so cute. Mm -hmm. She had those giant, round, dark eyes. And also, she could learn anything. She needs to be able to hit a mark. I said, give me 48 hours. 48 hours later, Ellie would walk out and hit her mark. (laughs) Wow. She was just whip smart. (laughs) Yeah. What kind of characteristics? I mean, I'm assuming, you know, each shoot's different as far as what they're looking for. But is there a certain quality in a Boston that the agents need in order to pitch to potential clients? Yeah. Every client sends a brief as to what they're looking for. And it does vary a little bit shoot to shoot. Obviously... As a breeder, markings shouldn't make as big an impact on my program. We always say breedings are the icing on the cake. We love a full collar. We love a full white leg. We love that beautiful blaze between the eyes. But as a breeder, structurally, if everything else is better on another dog that's darker in color, doesn't have as much white, Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the darker dog. But for photography and for ad purposes, they want that classic tuxedo. My dogs that have really excelled, tend to be the ones that have the more classic tuxedo. They seem to really love that big, dark, expressive eye. The one that when they look in the camera, it just, again, it melts your heart. They want them to look smart and soft and sweet all at the same time. That's physically what they're looking for. They tend to prefer black and whites and seals over brindles. If you do have a brindle, and this is kind of funny, they photoshopped my dog's stripes out. (laughs) Wow, okay. I've actually seen some photos of my dogs in ad work where I'm like, is that Tabby? And 
I realized it was, and I couldn't put my finger on why she looked different, and then I realized they'd photoshopped out her brindle. <laughs> That's funny. And they tend to prefer females over males for kind of the hmm. obvious reason. Yeah. I mean, my first thought is, like, aggression on set, possibly. For a family-friendly environment, they prefer females mm-hmm. over males. Okay. As far as, like, getting started with this and everything, did you have, like, the mentor, essentially, or does the agent hire, like, some type of coach to help you, or is it pretty much just you submitting stuff to agents and seeing what happens? Yeah, you kind of submit stuff to the agents and you dive in. Mm-hmm. It's a learning experience as you go, for sure. The people who referred me to my agent, they sort of gave me a heads up as to what to expect, roughly. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, she'll call you whenever they need a dog. It tends to be very last minute. She would call and she'd be like, hey, two weeks from today, can you be in New York? Or, hey, they just changed their mind as to what kind of dog they want for a shoot tomorrow. Can you be in the city? You have to be flexible. It's very last minute. There may be instances where you are in the running, anticipating driving to the city on Friday. And Friday, you're in the running for a shoot on Monday. And on Sunday, they'll be like, hey, they decided to go with a different dog. That happened a couple times. One thing I would say is be really flexible with the situation. And that's one thing I learned. And I was told that, but I didn't realize how flexible you had to be. It was very learning along the way how to deal with the clients, what was passe that you should not do Mm -hmm. with ad work and especially with TV work. You have to be really careful not to get starstruck. (laughs) They're very much like, hey, you're booked for this show. Just an FYI, this is who the special guest is. Don't make a big deal. Yeah. Can you kind of walk us through maybe, um, because I know you'd mentioned Saturday Night Live. Can you kind of walk us through that process? That was probably my favorite one we ever did. And it's so funny because our skits didn't even make it to air. <laughs> we got cut for time. Oh, man. And it was really funny. We did Saturday Night Live on the episode with Chris Pratt and Ariana Grande, mm-hmm. which, again, don't get starstruck. Sure. Right. Good luck uh-huh. with that. Chris Pratt is just as handsome in person as he is on TV and movies. And he's very funny. Ariana Grande is just a lovely person. Like, she's absolutely beautiful, and she's just so sweet and so kind. That's a really long day. Saturday Night Live is a very long day. You show up mid to late morning, because obviously it's a night show, and it is live, so you're going to be there quite a while. And you show up for run-throughs. Sometimes when you watch the show, they do, like, run-throughs of the halls. You're in the hall between the elevator lobby and the makeup counters. So you see everything that goes on. You're right beside the dressing rooms. And it's crazy, and it's awesome. And seeing the show put on, I have so much respect for everybody at that program. You go through all the run-throughs, and then they have sort of an official run-through at the beginning of the night, right before they record. And your sketch can get cut at that official run-through afterwards. They have a writer's meeting, or you can get cut after the filming, or they can run out of time. So there's sort of like three different times. You just don't know when you're going to leave. You're just there. But that was, like I said, one of the greatest experiences. That was with little Eloise. She was the one that they were like, this dog, we want her. She's so cute. Uh She went up and she was in a sketch with Chris Pratt that was cut for time. So did you actually get to that point where you got to meet him? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, I didn't get to meet him per se. I literally handed my dog to one of the actors. My dog Uh was in the sketch with him. I stood. Hey, that counts. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I stood maybe uh, 10 feet away and just got mm-hmm. to watch it all play out. And then she was handed back mm-hmm. to me. Huh. But because you're there all day and everybody else is there all day, sometimes the comedians stop and actually, like, visit and play with the dogs. Because, boy, that's a great stress reliever. My sort of cool experience was at one point Ariana Grande and all her backup dancers are walking down the hallway, see the dogs, squeal. Mm-hmm. She comes running over in these, like, 
four or five inch stilettos, throws herself down in the middle of all the dogs because there were several breeds there that day, uh-huh. and just starts cuddling with the dogs. Like, she was in heaven, and it was really cute to see how much everybody appreciated us being there. Yeah, that's awesome. As far as, like, whenever you're on set and everything, you've done confirmation since you're 12, so that obviously helps with being in mm-hmm. front of people on stage. Do they have a trainer on site to help during that live skit? Or would you be the one trying to help execute, you know, whatever it is they want your dog to do? They hire you as the dog's trainer, more or less. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it gets billed. Your dog is booked, but legally speaking, you are its minder or trainer because that's how it's paid out. For SNL, all she really had to do was sit on a lap, and then I just directed her where she was looking. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, she was supposed to look at the actor, and at one point, she was supposed to look at the camera. With still photo shoots, like when we did Children's Place, they'd place the kids. We'd walk her in. I'd put her on a sit-down, stay, whatever they would need. And then she'd just stay on her mark. And that was her whole training. That was the training for that. It was, hey, can you make her look here? Can you make her look there? Don't let her move. Easy Mm -hmm. enough. The most difficult one we had training-wise, we did last week tonight with John Oliver. Yes. And Mm -hmm. that was a pretty funny brief because the brief was for a Boston Terrier, highly expressive eyes, nice dark coat. Mm-hmm. And they wanted me to send photos of her feet. That's an which interesting was strange, request. Correct. Strangest brief I've ever had. They were like, mm-hmm. hey, can you send us detailed photos of the top and bottom of her feet? And at this point, they didn't tell me what the show was. They didn't tell me what. All I knew was it was video. They didn't tell me it was television. It was a video call for a Boston Terrier. And can you submit photos of her feet? And I was like, this is really kind of weird. But my agent was like, trust me, you want to do this. I was like, okay. So I submitted pictures of her feet, and she got it. And that's the point where they were like, your dog's going to be on last week tonight with John Oliver. And she's going to be, right, it was pretty cool. And they're like, and she's going to be Sonia Sotomayor. And I'm like, the Supreme Court judge? Uh (laughs) And I said, yep. Supreme Court judge. And at that point, I didn't even think about the foot thing until I got on set. What the show had done was they had made puppet feet, like exact replicas of her feet on puppet sticks. Yeah, I saw the clip. It looked pretty funny. I didn't see the full version. I'll be sure to include that in the show notes for people. It's totally worth seeing because (laughs) the level of detail they went to for this very short little story that they did is kind of incredible. They rebuilt more or less the entire chambers. It was real wood Supreme Court desk that they made and the carpet was real and everything was very thoughtfully created and very well made. And then they made her a tiny little robe that these tiny little Boston Terrier puppet hands sit through. And there was a puppeteer under the Supreme Court bench yeah, with a monitor so he could see what the hands were doing. And then he would move her paws to get the footage for the show. While this is all going on, there's every Supreme Court dog that they had there representing all the justices, including Ginsburg, mm-hmm. <laughs> who yeah. was a chihuahua. Uh, so cute. The um, glasses were they, spot on. Oh, it was fantastic. They had multiple little lace collars to try out on her. It was so cute. Every dog there had a different handler. The whole time they're filming this, they were like, okay, it's going to be silent, so you can give all the direction you want. They would tell us to play, and then all of us as their trainers are standing back going, watch me, sit, stay, don't move, watch (laughs) me. And it it was chaos. Yeah. But the final result was really good. So you have to have a very cool, calm, and collected dog, because how long was that take on this? Hours? They kept doing short takes. I mean, we were there well past lunch, because Mm -hmm. we started that, I want to say, in the morning, and then generally most shoots, they will feed you lunch while you're there, or dinner, as the case may be, with SNL. I can only think of one where it was like a half-day shoot. That was photography for a book. This is like the videos, commercials, things like that. How about a photography shoot? Is there any memorable experience that you could elaborate on for people? 
probably one of the most fun shoots I went to mm-hmm. was a photographer. She did a book called Between Two Dogs, and it was all based on this concept that she did this photo of a bulldog and her puppy, and she loved the way the two dogs interacted. She decided to build an entire coffee table book off of this concept of how dogs interact with each other. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful collection of photos, and it's a beautiful concept. Our agent, Linda, called us, and she said, hey, I have this photo shoot. Do you have any puppies right now? Mom and a puppy. And I said, oh, my gosh, good timing. I do. This was actually Bowie's first job. Mm-hmm. He was 12 or 14 weeks old. Oh, wow. And, yeah. yeah, he and his mom, Patty, got to go with me to New York, and we did this photo shoot. And it was kind of fun because a lot of them, they use the dog as props. Mm-hmm. You're there because your dog is a prop that's going to sit in the background or be held by someone. Or This one was 100% all about the dogs. They were like, have them interact. Here's a rope toy. See if you can get them to pull on it. We're going to smear peanut butter on her ear and see if he'll chew on it. They got to play and have fun, and it was so laid back. And She was such a lovely photographer to work with. I really enjoyed that one. Is that the one by Shauna Fishman? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. I tried to look it up online to see if I could see a picture, but it just had the cover photo. Yeah. Yes. I think I sent you some of the photos from that shoot from, okay. from the book. Yeah. There are two Boston Terriers on a white background, and it's mm-hmm. a mom and a puppy. It's adorable. It was so cute. Like I said, I really enjoyed that one. Mm-hmm. As far as, like, you know, someone just starting out, Maybe they're kind of like you. Know, they've been breeding Boston's for a while and want to try to step into this industry. What direction would you point them to, basically? It's a learning experience as you go, for sure. First things first is you find an agent and you have to keep after them. Make sure they know you're there. Don't be pushy, but, hey, here's my current dog. If you get some new dogs, you send them updated photos. A lot of agents, at least in my area now, I'm in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. All of our work was in New York, but down here, a lot of the agents post calls. You have to keep an eye on sort of their social media. They'll be like, hey, heads up, if you have a Boston that's under 15 pounds, contact us and send us a headshot, and we sent stuff for that. Okay. I almost feel like you kind of have to be a breeder. I mean, as far as, like, having more opportunities, you know, just because you have baby puppies, you know, every now and again, and your dogs at different stages in their life. Yeah. The people who actually turned me on to this were not breeders. They had a really mm-hmm. well-trained dog. Mm-hmm. It depends on what you want to do. I do know other breeders who do a lot of bad work because yeah. they have puppies. Yeah. Twice I've had a puppy or a litter of puppies that have been used because they were puppies. Mm-hmm. But if you have seen the coach ads with French Bulldogs, that's Not actually yet. a friend of mine. Those are her dogs, okay. for the most part. Most of them yeah. are her dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and she goes through, I believe, the same agent I did. And so for her, especially with Coach, because they use a lot of French Bulldog puppies, that's very much an in for her. But when you have these ads and stuff where they're looking for an adult Boston, you absolutely could do it with just a really nicely well-trained family pet. And I say well-trained, even if they're just sitting there, they need to have basic obedience manners. They need right. to be non-reactive around other dogs. They need to be kid safe. Mm-hmm. Those are sort of the three things I think that go into making a dog that does well in okay. advertising. Mm-hmm. Could you recommend mm-hmm. agency or just like Google, you know, dog agency I, and something would pop up? Yeah, I mean, it depends on where you are. If you're near a major city, there's more likely to be some kind of animal agent in your area. If mm-hmm. you're rural, you might need to drive. I regularly drove to New York, which is, depending on traffic, sometimes <laughs> two plus hours away. Yeah. But I would say just try to link up with an agent in your area because finding gigs without one is slim. Mm-hmm. Most ad agencies and most companies that are going to use an animal want to go through an agent because an agent's going to pre-screen dogs for their skill levels and their abilities, and they're going to know, at least after their first instance with the owner, 
if that trainer really knows what they're doing, if they can right. pull it off. Mm-hmm. Because once you've worked with a client, if they have a positive experience, a lot of times they'll ask for you back. That's okay. how we ended up with the children's place ads because Eloise, I mean, she made me look good. She was a consummate mm-hmm. professional and she worked with them several times because of that. Yeah, I just did a quick Google search of dog model agency. I'm in Kansas City, and yeah, so there's actually mm-hmm. one in every city pretty much. There really is. It's kind of amazing because it seems like all advertising that uses animals is going to go through an agent. As far as, like, pay and everything, what would be, like, a reasonable range? I mean, of course it varies, but is, like, $100 yeah. a job or? It varies as to where the job is. Mm-hmm. And it varies as to what the job is. And the one thing that I noticed, having a good agent can make a difference as to pay scale. Our agent was awesome because if the client really wanted one of my dogs, she was very clear with the client that I was coming in up to two hours away and that I needed a little extra per diem for the travel, which was really, really nice of her and thoughtful. Price-wise, we tended to not do lower-end jobs because it was such a travel situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Per diem, I want to say there are lower jobs. There are $100 a day jobs. There are Mm -hmm. $200 a day jobs. The most per diem was in the $400 or $500 range. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's where the Um, the majority of the money is coming from, basically. Sometimes the client would be flexible. If I had parking, they'd cover that. And sometimes Mm -hmm. they're like, no parking's on you. Yeah. It really varies quite a bit job to job. That's for Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. I could imagine. As far as, like, movies, is that something special, or is it pretty much through the same agencies? I love the idea of getting into movies Mm -hmm. with my dogs. but. That tends to be pretty specialized. There are some people I know who have had dogs in movies or have had parts in movies. Generally, movie studios like to work with a trainer that trains for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that trainer sometimes sources dogs. They're basically a special dog trainer, and they handle multiple breeds probably and then have a connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there are situations that I know that are like that where Mm -hmm. they have a trainer that really specializes. And it is very specialized because we've done some work for social media clips. And Mm -hmm. it gets hard once you start turning sound on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Anything else you'd like to share on the podcast or tips? The only thing I can think of is if you do want to see my dogs, Mm -hmm. Bowie, my current Boston, does have an Instagram account. It's Boston Terrier Bowie. And if anybody did want to get in touch with me, my email is calaverabostons at gmail.com. Okay. And I'll put that in the show notes be below. Perfect. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions anybody would have. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for doing the podcast and everything. And I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Once again, in order to reach Patty, I'll leave all of her contact information in the show notes below, as well as her website, because she is a Boston Terrier breeder. She has adorable Bostons, so if you're looking at getting one, I highly recommend Patty. And once again, if you want to get the full text of this podcast episode, go to bostonterriersociety.com. There's going to be a link in the show notes below, and you'll be able to see the full text so you can read it, as well as get links to hopefully your Boston can become a model someday. And I'd love to hear about it. Have a great day. I hope you liked this episode and talk to you guys later. Thanks.